Hey everybody, my name is Ted Forbes and welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. And today in our show, I'm going to continue on the path we've talked about the last couple episodes of some classic medium format cameras. And what I want to talk about today, last time we did the Czechoslovakian made Flexoret, and I want to talk about Roloflex cameras today. And this is my little Roly TLR. This model is actually an MX EVS, and I'll talk about the model names and differences in a second. This is a uh, more practical model. This was the economy car model they made. Uh, it was totally cheap, but it also was more practical than some of the more expensive models they made. But this one was done in the 50s for a couple of years. Um, Roloflexes really are the king of TLR camera design. Um, most other manufacturers were copies of this design. Um, Roloflex just really owned that market. And if you ever have the chance to shoot on a Roli uh, versus any of these other cameras, even this model of Roli, uh, there's a huge difference. And we talk, I, last time I made the comparison of, you know, these are engineered a lot like a Swiss watch is, and this is impressively so. Um, even for a camera that is, you know, over 60 years old now, this still functions beautifully. Um, everything feels great on it. It is smooth to use. The viewfinders are all really bright in the Roloflexes, which is a problem sometimes with, with the fact that you're putting light through a mirror and shooting it up. Um, it, Roloflex really were the king of that. Um, most Roloflexes feature very well-designed optics, so the lenses typically are either going to be Carl Zeiss lenses or they're going to be Schneider Kretschnock lenses. Um, the Carl Zeiss lenses, there's two or three three models of Carl Zeiss that you're going to find in these. There is the Tessar design and the Planar design. And what's interesting is, is I don't know if most people know, these are really old lens designs, actually. Um, the Planar is actually older. I believe it was in the 1890s at some point it was developed. Um, it is six elements in four groups. And the Tessar, which is a little bit less involved, um, less expensive to make, uh, actually came later, I think in 1902 or so. And that design features four elements in three groups, I believe. So that that's the big difference between the two. Now you can argue that to death. This is kind of like the megapixel argument today or pixel peaking and stuff. Um, you know, both are capable of producing very sharp and very beautiful results. Um, some will argue that the planar is their preferred lens and is slightly better. And then there's the Schneider lenses, which are all unbelievably, amazingly beautiful as well. Um, the Roloflex lenses, um, generally speaking, medium format. The first Roly cameras were actually 117 format. And then there was also a baby Roloflex, which was a 127, I believe. Um, most of the ones you're going to find um, are 120 format, regular medium format, and feature lenses that are in the 80 millimeter range. This one's actually 75 millimeter, so it's close. And you're going to find them with the maximum aperture at either 2.8 or 3.5. So that's the basis for a lot of the major model names that they did. There was the Rolex Cord, and there were some other things that were like you know less expensive, kind of cheap models. Uh, but the big Roloflexes were were the 2.8 or the 3.5, and then they had a lettering system, so you'd have the 2.8. You know, there was the ABC. C, D, E, and F. And it gets a little confusing. The most sought after model period on Rollies, which is the most collectible, is the 2.8F. Um, I do not have one. I would love to have one, but um, I just have never been able to justify parting with the money for one that's in really good working order. They're not horribly expensive, but it will run you over $1,000 for a medium format camera, which I'm sure it's worth every penny, and they're beautiful cameras, but I just haven't been able to justify it myself, which is why I ended up getting the MX EBS when I went for mine. Um, Due to the age of these cameras, just like all the other cameras I've shown you recently, like the Pentacon 6 or even the Flexoret, um, the Rollies do require maintenance. And there are a few people, and I'll find, I can't remember who they are right offhand, but there's a couple people who specialize in Rolly repair and will do a clean lube and adjustment for you and fix any major problems. Uh, you usually have to send your camera off to them and pay them money to do it, but you can get them serviced because of the age of these, you will deal with servicing uh, at some point. Um, the biggest problem that I have, sometimes people have shutter issues. I've never had that. Uh, your shutter may need to be rebuilt. Um, the biggest issue I have is, is uh, just the nature of the size of the camera is in the, the tracking um, with the uh, with the film as it goes through. Um, sometimes you start to get overlay on frames and your tracking needs to be adjusted. So anyway, that's the basic nitty gritty on the Rollflex. So what I want to do is let's do a little up close on this and I want to break it down and show you how everything on here works. And and why I think it's amazing. Okay, so we're going to go up and close here with the Roloflex. This is the MX EVS. And I forgot to mention in the intro that there are a couple other variations on the Roloflex other than the standard models that were very well known. These are all fixed lens cameras. So it wasn't until Mamiya came out with, um, with the C3 series that you had interchangeable lenses where you could go with different focal lengths. But Roly did also make a Tele Roly, uh, which had, I believe, a 135 sonar lens on it, which was f4. Uh, 
um, beautiful. They're just very rare. They didn't make a lot of them. And there's also a wide angle Roly, which had, I think it was a 40 millimeter lens, which was also F4, uh, both Carl Zeiss. Um, both of those, if you can find them, they're, they'll destroy you in terms of budget because they're just outrageously expensive. Um, they're collector's items. They're really rare. Again, this is why I think the MX EVS is your best bet because it is not as desirable a collector model, but it still has all the wonderful things that make the Roly Roly. Um, so anyway, the biggest difference here, instead of an 80 millimeter lens, we have the Carl Zeiss. This is a Tessar lens and it's a 75 millimeter. So it's a little bit shorter than the, the, the 80 millimeter standard for medium format, but not that you're going to be extremely noticeable with. So anyway, on the front of the camera, we have obviously the, the, the two lenses and then we have the shutter speed and the aperture dials, which I'll get into in a second because uh, I want to show you how that works. There's a coupler on here that I want to talk about. Um, on the bottom, this is your um, this is your fire button. So when you're ready to take a picture, you hit that. And it's also got a lock on it. And on the other side, you have a flash sync and you have the M and X settings. And I talked about a little, this a little bit with the uh, FlexRed, but on cameras of this age, um, this goes back to the days where people used to use those big, annoying, loud flash bulbs like uh, Ouija used a TLR, I believe, and probably a Roloflex. Um, and when you're using the big flash bulbs that go off, uh, you know, they're very bright. And so there was a setting on here. You have MX syncs. And so you could sync to the bulb. And so basically they would fire the picture just a second, fraction of a second after the flash went off. You don't need that today. So, you know, you just want to have a, a standard flash sync. Again, this is a leaf shutter like the last one. So you just see the shutter blades open and close, which means you can pretty much do flash sync at any speed, which is much different than the shutter curtain that you have in modern camera design from 35 millimeter on. Okay, so looking at the viewfinder on the MX EVS here, I'm gonna go ahead and pull this up. This is where you're gonna start to see some of the fine quality engineering and design come into effect because like on the, the FlexRet that we looked at last time, sometimes it's just a matter of popping over a magnifying glass or something like that. On the Roloflex, uh, on this model, you simply pull this lever here and your magnifier pops up. It does have a black uh, piece of metal around it, which allows some of the light to, you know, be out of your way and you can actually get a better focus when you're actually fine focusing. And the other cool thing about this design that I really love is when I push the front end out, you're going to be stuck with a similar, you know, the crude action sports viewfinder where you're just going to look through um, the square here to frame up. But what's really cool is there's a second magnifying glass. I know this is just about impossible to see here because I'm not actually focusing on anything, but this allows me to just look a little bit at the ground glass. So you can just move your eye up or down and that still allows you to see what you're focusing on. So if you're trying to shoot something in a hurry and frame it up with just the cutout, I still can simply get a little reflector in there, which is on the bottom side of this front piece here, which allows me to see the ground glass, just a portion of it, and I can actually focus on it. So it's, it's kind of similar to like on some of the Micro Four Thirds cameras when you move the focusing ring and it zooms in so you can see a little bit of it. It's kind of an old analog way of doing that, which is, I think, really kind of cool. To release this, you simply push that in a little bit, pops the front part back out, and then you're good to go down. This whole thing is just so well built, and it, it's just like, it, it's butter when I open that up. It just wants to open itself. It's just the springs and the hinging and all that is just, it's amazing in here. And uh, anyway, it's one of the things that makes the Roller Flex great. Um, also cool is the way you get the back open. When I move this lever on the front, it pushes this lip out here and allows this to detach. And I basically just open it up. You have your taking spool. You move that over here, put your film in, wind it up, and you're good to go. To wind and advance the film, you have a simple crank over here. But just like the interior and the way it's flocked and just everything is just so well done and so well taken care of. Even the um, the the film back here, which keeps your film pressed flat when you're shooting. I mean, just everything is just so well done and so well engineered. Uh, like I said, these two dials on the side, this is what you use to, to you pull that out and you're able to move your spool and then pull that out to get it in up here. So that's what those are. They're just the releases for the actual film spool. Um, everything else is just beautiful. The, the, the rollers, everything is just in fine shape. And, you know, I really can't rave about this camera enough. Um, also, as typical of a lot of cameras back in the days before they had meters inside the cameras, um, you do have this little grid on the back with some scenes of snow and people ice skating in various situations and how to set your exposure correctly for that. The last thing I want to show you too, this one, this camera does not have a meter, by the way. Um, some of the other more expensive models did. Um, this one is meterless, so you do need to use an external meter or Sunny 16 or something as you're going. The last thing I want to show you, and this was a big deal back in its day, um, but it's a coupling exposure finder here, and it's more 
coupled, I think, if you saw the video we did on the Flexoret because it had the little teeth and the grooves and you're able to do that. So if you can find your exposure number and you see these numbers on this dial here. So you have, you know, like 12, 10, or it's just basically one through, sorry, four through 18. Uh, if you're metering with a hand meter, you can just find what that number is and I'll show you how you can couple this to get the correct exposure compensation. It's really advanced how this is designed. It's not obvious, but it does work. Um, I'm going to flip this over a little bit, and I don't know if you'll be able to pick this up on the video or not, but there's a small window here, and there's two numbers that you see in there. The top one is the shutter speed, which I have set at a 30th of a second right now, and the bottom one is the f-stop. And so if I turn this dial here, this will change the f-stop for the lens. So if I want to open that all the way to 3.5, I simply roll this over until I hit 3.5, and then I can adjust the exposure setting and the shutter speed here. So I'm at 500, 250, and those numbers are in red at the top. That's probably really hard to see on the video, but that, that is what that's indicating. Now, here's the weird thing is when I turn the shutter speed dial, you're gonna notice that this little arrow here in the middle, I don't know if you can see that, it's coupled with this dial. So when I turn the f-stop, notice how that, that arrow over there is turning. So it, they're connected. What that allows me to do is too quickly if I know my exposure value is going to be basically set at 10, 11, let's say, then I need to find a corresponding shutter speed that does it. So if I, if I open the f-stop up and now my, it says I'm exposing at 13, I need to bring this around back to 10, so or 11 or wherever we were, whatever you're metering. So it's exposure number metering and that's really not done as much today. More advanced cameras came out later where these things were actually coupled physically so you could set it and like we saw in the Flexorette and all you do is one move one dial and they're both stuck. That's kind of the early crude mechanism of doing that here. And it's just interesting how just the top of this knob is coupled with the uh, with the aperture dial. So anyway, that is the Roloflex MX EVS uh, complete with flash sync and the uh, just beautiful lens and everything else. Like I said, this is a Tessar and a lot of people claim that the Planar is actually um, significantly better even the Xenar, which came later, um, the Schneider lenses, uh, sonars, all those. But anyway, uh, it's a four group, three element lens, three element, nah, four element, three group lens, and it shoots beautiful photos. I absolutely adore this camera. Also, one other point here, you're going to notice some notches around the lenses. They did make a set of filters that you could put on these cameras. Um, the usual fare of red filters, green filters, orange filters, etc. And then you could do close up filters. Um, I don't have any actually personally because they get into that collector territory. So typically I will hold a filter over the lens if you do need to use an orange filter or a red filter. Um, and I've also done macro with this camera. You do need to know that there's parallax correction. So if you're shooting up close and you're using a close up lens, you're actually going to have to focus and frame and then move the camera up an inch or so. I used to know exactly what it was to get the taking lens before you took the picture. So there was a little bit of work arounding to do, but um, it's just fun to do. And I, this camera is such a joy to shoot on, even when you're having to really rig it out like that to make it do something it's not wanting to do natively. It's still a joy to use. So that is the Roloflex MX EVS. So that is the Roloflex MX EVS. Um, the MX EVS that I have, like I said, this was kind of the Honda of Rollies uh, in their line. It was not super cheap like the Rolla Cords, uh, but still capable of making good images. Just a very practical camera. It may not have had all the bells and whistles and the refinement of something like the 28F, but it was still a very good, de decent camera for its day. Like I said, these were built for a couple of years during the 1950s. Um, I think this is my recommendation if you're interested in a Rolleiflex and you don't want to spend just an extreme amount of money. Um, you're going to find these, depending on the condition, um, you know, usually around the $200 to $300 range, which I don't think is, honestly, considering the quality of images this camera will produce, it's a steal. Um, but for a film camera that's this old, I understand that, that you know, finances do come into play. Uh, a 2.8F, for instance, is going to run you well over 1000 or maybe 2000 depending on how collectible it is, how classic it is. Um, there were a ton of photographers who shot on Rollies back in their day, people like David Bailey, um, you know, Helmut Newton, I think, at one point shot on a Roll of Flex. Um, it was really the standard of medium format in its day. Um, and like I said, you know, if you look around, just make sure, you know, condition stuff like that. eBay, unfortunately, is the unnecessary, necessary evil at times, I understand. Um, and you really have to be careful on there because sometimes these are old and they do come with issues. Uh, if you get one that does have issues, you probably are going to have to spend a couple hundred dollars more repairing it or at least getting it cleaned and fine-tuned. Well worth the investment. When you have one of these in working order, um, if you like to shoot film and you like to shoot medium format, they are just simple 
simply beautiful. Um, they're unbelievable. They're the Rolls Royce of, of TLR cameras. And not to, not to say anything negative about the Flexorette that we covered last time or some of the other ones that I'll show you, but um, I was a big TLR junkie at one point in my career. And uh, I just, I, these are fantastic cameras. So anyway, that is the Roll Flex. I will put relevant links to things in the show notes and join us every week here on The Art of Photography. We actually do three shows a week now, so be sure to check them out. Easiest thing to do is subscribe to the channel. That way you're always up on what's current. And, uh, you know, that's about it. We have our regular show that we do on Sundays. This is a longer show. We stretch out a little bit. And then we have two weekly shows. We have photo threes and then a Friday Q&A. So be sure to tune into those if you haven't seen them yet. Anyway, once again, guys, this has been The Art of Photography. And thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Later.